This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Price plunge, oil prices dropped to a near six year low following a few days of relative stability. But how low is too low when it comes to crumbling crude? Double whammy, earnings season is here and with oil prices tumbling and the dollar soaring, will companies have a new excuse for soft results? And first up Alcoa, it beat earnings estimates today and the former Dow member has seen its stock double since being tossed out of the blue chip index. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, January 12th. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sue Herrera. Well, if rainy days and Mondays always get you down, you were not alone today. On a cold and damp rainy day on Wall Street, stocks dipped lower again, pushed down by tumbling energy prices, which neared fresh six-year lows by the end of the session. The reason? Global oil supplies continue to outstrip demand. And just today, Goldman Sachs slashed its forecast on oil, calling for even further declines in the prices in the year ahead. At the NYMEX today, domestic oil prices fell another 4 percent, down $2.29 a barrel, closing at 46 bucks, the lowest since April of 2009. Foreign Brent crude was down even more, falling $2.68 a barrel, settling at 47.43, the lowest since March of 2009. With oil prices in free fall, many are asking not just how low can oil go, but how low is too low. Jackie DeAngelis has more. The crude crush continues with no end in sight. Prices on both sides of the Atlantic now under $50 a barrel. While cheap crude means consumers could save 50 to 75 billion on gas this year, according to AAA, many are wondering how low is too low for oil. The tipping point where the drag on the economy outweighs the pickup in consumer spending. We're in the beginnings part of the price zone right now that hurts production in a big way and starts to reverberate through the economy, the manufacturing economy especially. It'll be particularly painful if we do break the $40 level and then if we do break the $33 level, which is my low price target, and we go down into the 20s, uh, then it's going to be a, a real uh, bleak situation. Production is just one risk if oil falls too low. The ripple effect is big oil laying off workers and pulling back on hiring. The number of jobs in, in the exploration and production industry probably number around 500,000 jobs. The multiplier effect, the support services, the dry cleaners and restaurants and real estate around those jobs add probably another three to four times. So in theory, upwards of 1.5 million jobs could be at stake. There's also a global impact. Low oil prices don't just hurt the U.S. It hits Canada. I mean, it hits Russia. It hits Venezuela. Uh, so there, there could be the makings of a global uh, financial crisis as the fallout uh, from the impact on these countries. So how low will oil prices go and how long will we stay there? Goldman Sachs adjusting its 2015 price forecast to $47 a barrel and saying we could stay under $45 before the fourth quarter of this year. I do agree with Goldman Sachs's forecast. When you look at the supply demand dynamic, it's still heavily skewed towards the supply side, and it doesn't look like it's going to change before the beginning of the summer. So I would expect prices to be low uh, going into the summer. While supply is key, so is demand, and neither are seen changing anytime soon. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. It's winter, in case you hadn't noticed, but it's also earnings season when companies post how much they made or lost last quarter, how they did it, and what they look to for the future. And tonight, as always, or as usual at least, aluminum giant Alcoa kicks off the fourth quarter earnings season, and it posted a solid beat. Earnings of 33 cents a share, excluding certain items, easily topping the Wall Street forecast, as you see there. Revenues of nearly $6.4 billion also beat estimates on a 14 percent jump in year-over-year -year sales. Shares initially higher in after-hours trading after uh, issuing some promising guidance and upbeat comments from Alcoa's CEO. If you look at the up, uh, the revenues up 14%, uh, and by the way, 50% of that is driven purely by organic growth. Uh, the profitability is up, uh, and literally we have a, I would almost call it a business trifecta. We have three groups, and all of the three groups are performing very, very well. 
Morgan Brennan with us now with her takeaway from Alcoa's latest results, a business trifecta, he says. A business trifecta, and certainly we've seen stronger aluminum prices contributing uh, to Alcoa's stronger than expected earnings. But I think the bigger story here is this is a rebound and transformation mm -hmm. story. To use uh, CEO Kleinfeld's own words, an accelerated transformation. And so the stronger than expected numbers in fourth quarter and a stronger than expected full year are really uh, indicative of what we've seen, of this transformation we've seen from a mining company to an industrial manufacturer. So value added businesses contributing products to aerospace and automotive industries. And we really saw that shift take place over the year. And we've started to see that trickle out to the bottom line. So, uh, you know, you'd look at the revenue increase year over year. Here's the even bigger number. Profits, earnings per share adjusted. Mm -hmm. 725% increase wow. over the fourth quarter of 2013. So he's really engineered quite a turnaround there. It's been quite a turnaround, and you really also see that in Alcoa stock. Uh, since the company left the Dow Industrials, the shares have just about doubled versus the Dow 17% gain. Lots of company CEOs probably saying, kick me out of the Dow. <laughs> Morgan Brennan. Just kidding, folks. Morgan, thank you. All right, joining us tonight, Andrew Berkeley. He uh, joins us to talk more about the fourth quarter earnings season and the impact it might have on the market. He is a portfolio strategist at Oppenheimer & Company. Welcome. Nice to have you with us, Andrew. Hi, Sue. Welcome. Thank you. Overall, what kind of a season do you think it's going to be? There's been so many cross currents between lower oil prices, the higher U.S. dollar. How's it going to shake out this time around? Yeah, I'm expecting a pretty wide range of results, uh, meaning that if you look at uh, analyst consensus, they're only looking for about 1% growth in the S&P 500, uh, which would be the lowest growth rate since the third quarter of 2012. Uh, if you take out energy, it's a little bit better. It's about 4%. But if you go down at the industry level, what we're going to find is a really wide disparity between um, you know, the losers of the earnings season, energy and energy-related ideas that are going to be down well in excess of 20% in terms of earnings growth. But on the other side, you're going to have a lot of positives, which are, uh, you know, in technology, healthcare, consumer discretionary, you're going to see a lot of double-digit earnings gains. So for one quarter in, in quite a long period of time, I think you can see a very big disparity between uh, industries and stocks, for that matter. Do you think, Andrew, that uh, the uh, forecasters who see 1% uh, earnings growth and only 1% are being a little too dour? Yeah, Tyler, I mean, as you know, it's, it's really about the level of growth, and it's also about the expectations going into the earnings season. So we've seen those numbers come down by about 6% during the quarter, um, which is pretty pessimistic. You know, we think the, the bar is, is pretty low at this point. So non-energy earnings should be able to surpass those results pretty easily. Uh, and most importantly, we think the guidance is actually going to be pretty upbeat, uh, given the better economic and macro data that we've seen um, coming into the beginning of the year. But what about the strength of the dollar? For those multinational corporations, um, might it be a bit of a headwind this time? Yeah, the other big theme is definitely going to be the currency. So certainly the dollar's been very strong. That is going to be a headwind uh, for companies that derive a lot of their revenues overseas. Uh, it'll be more of a benefit for those domestic-oriented uh, uh, companies, especially those with lower input costs from commodities where the higher dollar is actually keeping commodity mm -hmm. prices down. So it should be a bit of a net net. In aggregate, the S&P 500 derives about 70% of its revenues domestically and about 30% overseas. So Andrew, let's uh, bring it to round third brace, base and bring it home. Uh, are earnings at this level uh, high enough to, s to sustain and justify stock prices at today's levels? Yeah, just about. Uh, valuations are definitely at the high end of the range. We've seen some volatility coming into the year. Uh, you know, if we have 3 or 4% earnings growth at the end of the day, that's not enough, I think, to support the multiple. So that's going to have to accelerate in forward quarters. So we're going to have to hope if we do have a bit of a stumble, uh, it is a temporary event and we get back onto a stronger uh, earnings trajectory as we move through the year. All right, Andrew, we'll let you go. Thank you so much. Andrew Bl Very Berkeley welcome. with Oppenheimer & Company. Ty? And more now, Sue, on another losing day on Wall Street as another steep drop in oil prices did drag equities lower with Chevron and ExxonMobil among the biggest decliners in the Dow. Today, those blue-chip stocks fell 96 points, just four points shy of a streak of five days in a row of triple-digit moves one way or the other. The Nasdaq was off 39, and the S&P was lower by 16. A top Fed policymaker says the nation's central bank should stop talking about the need to be 
patient when it's about to hike interest rates. Richmond Federal Reserve Bank President Jeffrey Lacker thinks that in order to keep inflation under control, the Fed should raise rates sooner rather than later. And he said that by dropping the word patient from its guidance, the Fed would be signaling that a rate hike is near. The U.S. healthcare industry is a $3 trillion behemoth. And that's why the annual J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference in San Francisco, the industry's biggest, is sometimes called the Woodstock of Healthcare. Meg Terrell has more on some of the big deals and major themes of this year's conference. It was a big day for drug deals and clinical data. The annual J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference kicked off with a bang. Shire announced a $5.2 billion acquisition of drug maker NPS Pharmaceuticals. Swiss drug giant Roche is taking a majority stake in Foundation Medicine, paying more than double the diagnostic company's share price. And Bristol-Myers announced a lung cancer trial of its immunotherapy drug Opdivo was stopped early because it met its goal, helping patients live longer than a standard chemotherapy. Amid the swirl of news, the question on everyone's mind is, can biotech and pharma continue the success they saw in 2014? I would hope so. Look, I think the outperformance is due to substance. It's not hype. It's not over expectations. It's the fact that companies have brought forward a lot of very interesting new drugs. The J.P. Morgan conference sets the agenda for the year ahead in healthcare. More than 400 companies present to about 9,000 investors over four days in San Francisco. The mood on day one was upbeat, as one might expect after five years of biotech outperforming the broader market. Concerns on CEOs' minds? Drug pricing, a debate that started to heat up in 2014 around the cost of new medicines for hepatitis C. And concerns there will be more pressure in other diseases. I believe that there's been a modicum of pricing pressure for, for some time now. I, I mean, I think if you go back uh, five or ten years, we're, we're seeing much more focus on value. Uh, we're seeing payers and 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 patients demand more for the, the medicines that they're buying. I think that's a trend that will uh, that will continue. I don't think it's it's only diabetes and oncology. I think it, you're going to see that uh, more broadly. But half a dozen industry leaders all had the same answer when asked about biotech's prospects for 2015. Asked if biotech will again outperform for the sixth year in a row, all said a resounding yes. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell in San Francisco. And still ahead tonight, the big money game of college football. It's getting even bigger, but not necessarily for the athletes. Is it time for them to be compensated financially? Republican-controlled Senate is taking up legislation to resume construction of the controversial Keystone Pipeline, setting up a showdown with President Obama after he vowed to veto the bill if it passes. The candidate to Texas oil pipeline bill was approved in the House last week. The U.S. military Central Command had its Twitter and YouTube accounts hacked for a short time today by people claiming to work with the Islamic State militants. The Twitter site even posted a threat that said, quote, American soldiers, we are coming. Watch your back, end quote. No classified material was exposed, and Pentagon officials, which quickly suspended the sites, called the breach embarrassing but not a threat. Well, that unsettling cyber attack on the U.S. military comes the same day President Obama pushed for new measures uh, to uh, protect the nation's computer networks from hackers. This is a direct threat to the economic security of American families, and we've got to stop it. If we're going to be connected, then we need to be protected. John Harwood joins us now from Washington with more on the new cybersecurity and identity theft initiative uh, that the president now plans to outline in his State of the Union address. We know, John, uh, that the timing of this new White House plan could not have been, I guess, more ironic. What's in it? Well, the White House essentially is trying to make sure that everyone has maximum information about what's happening to their identity. So it places requirements on businesses to notify customers if they're 
uh, identities or information has been compromised. And I think that's where you may see some of the political disagreement over how much onus is going to be put on business as opposed to uh, on consumers themselves. Uh, I do think, though, this is a promising area for bipartisan compromise because everyone has seen uh, what happened to Sony Pictures. Everyone's mm -hmm. seen the stories about Target and Walmart and where customers' data has been uh, hacked. And so I think the president seizing on this is one way that he might be able to find uh, a place to work with the Republican Congress. John, can I turn you back to the uh, Keystone Pipeline? Has there been any movement on either side in terms of the congressional opposition that exists to Keystone? No, I don't think so. I think what we're going the next step we're going to see is once we get a Senate vote on this, uh, it will get the 60 votes needed to uh, go to final vote and it will pass, but it will not have the uh, 67 votes needed to override a presidential veto, just as it was well short, maybe 15 votes short uh, uh, or more in the House of Representatives of, on uh, uh, over veto override strength. So I think that's when the negotiations are going to happen after it clears the Senate. A quick thought on something that is uh, sort of uh, more purely political, and that was I was a bit surprised to hear the press secretary uh, today say that the White House regrets not having sent someone higher in the administration uh, to the uh, solidarity demonstrations in Paris. That's right. I think the White House decided to admit a mistake there. They were getting a lot of criticism. They didn't say they regretted the president not showing up, but they said a higher ranking official than the U.S. ambassador who was there, Eric Holder, of course, the outgoing attorney general, was in Paris for meetings, did not make time for this. Uh, and I think given the presence of other world leaders, uh, including Benjamin Netanyahu, the, who the French had asked not to show up, the White House decided that they need to acknowledge some of the criticism of not being, mm -hmm. uh, taking a more active role. John, thank you, as always. Appreciate you it. Bet. John Harwood in Washington. Tiffany shares have their worst day in 10, count them, 10 years, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. Apparently, there weren't uh, too many little blue Tiffany boxes under the tree this year, not as many as Tiffany would have liked. The high-end jeweler cut its profit guidance for the full year, citing a disappointing holiday season and a stronger U.S. dollar. Shares off about 14% to 89.01. Different story for Lululemon. Yoga apparel retailer raised its current uh, quarter revenue and profit guidance thanks to improving trends and strong holiday results. The stock almost 7% higher, 62.59 the close. Express joined Lululemon and uh, reported a better than expected holiday shopping period. The retailer also upped its profit guidance for the fourth quarter and the full year. Shares up 3% to 1457. A warning from SanDisk weighed on its shares today. The flash memory provider said fourth quarter revenue would come in below its previous forecast because of weaker than expected sales of its retail products. Shares slumped. They were down 14 percent to 83.57. American Airlines saw its percentage of seats filled decline in December, which is a key metric that measures air traffic, but it did see its capacity increase. It also said that its fourth quarter revenue unit will be lower than expected. Shares were off more than 4.5% today to 49.58. And adding to the list of earnings warnings today, Core Labs, the oil field services company, also cut its fourth quarter guidance. But separately, after the bell, it announced an increase to its dividend. The payout is now 50 cents a share, which is a 10% increase. The annual yield on the dividend, 2.1%. Shares closed 7% lower to 103.91. And Dollar Tree says it expects to reach an agreement by the end of the month with the Federal Trade Commission on its planned purchase of Family Dollar. The retailer added that it expects to divest less than 300 stores to make that deal happen. Separately, Family Dollar sent a letter to shareholders repeating its recommendation on that shareholders go with the Dollar Tree acquisition over the proposed takeover bid from Dollar General. Got all that? <laughs> Shares of all three retailers traded. It's a very complicated story. Traded lower today. That's a lot of dollars. That's a lot of dollars. And speaking of dollars, uh, Oregon and Ohio State take the field in just uh, this evening uh, in the football playoff championship game. It will undoubtedly shine the spotlight on the age-old debate about whether or not college athletes should be paid dollars for playing. Many already have full scholarships and medical care, but is that sufficient? Former NFL player Jack Brewer joins us now with his thoughts. He's CEO and founder of his own money management firm, the Brewer Group. Jack, always great to see you. You played intercollegiate football. This uh, new playoff structure has generated millions, maybe even billions in uh, extra revenue for schools. The coaches are paid millions of dollars a year. Should players be compensated too? 
Definitely, Tyler. And you know, you know me. I'm a capitalist. But at the same time, you know, it's it's, it's right and wrong. And if you look at, at all the hours that these players are putting in, it's it's just a shame that many of them are going through, you know, three, four years of college, no degree, and no compensation. And at some point, we have to change the system. There are those who would say, Jack, though, that there many of them do have full scholarships and medical care, and that that should be enough compensation, um, especially since if they do finish uh, college before they join the pros, if they join the pros, um, basically they've had a great education and they can go on. And it is for a large majority. You know, probably 90 to 92 percent of, of players would never even ask uh, for compensation. Most guys would rather go, you know, go get for a four-year degree at a university, but there's a small percentage that are just there. You know, they're wasting scholarships. They're not going to class anyway. Mm -hmm. A lot of them don't, don't graduate, so why not take those scholarships and give it to someone else who's really going to use it? So let's talk a little bit about the, some things that rather surprise me. One, as I did my research, was the, the NCAA rule that caps the amount of money that, that athletes can make outside uh, in their spare time at something like $2,000 a year. I understand why uh, that rule is there, so that some big uh, alumni can't give a kid a $10,000 job that he doesn't or she doesn't show up for. Uh, but $2,000 in this day and age sounds a little low to me. Yeah, it's, it's pretty sad. You know, I had, I had two children while I played college football, and you're talking 15 years ago, Tyler. I was only allowed to make $2,000 per year. Uh, so you can only imagine there's so many guys with families, they have other obligations, they come from backgrounds where their p parents don't really have a lot of money. And so it's, it's just, it's, it's almost, it's un-American to, to put these players through that and not allow them to make an, a living. You know, the other issue which you're so very familiar with in, in, when you um, financially counsel and, and handle client accounts, especially with former NFL players, is whether or not these, these young people are capable of managing whatever, if they were paid, would they be able to, to manage it financially and sufficiently? What do you think? I think you can put in, you know, compensation deferment programs. I mean, you don't have to pay players all their money up front. You know, you really can put procedures in place that, that will, you know, teach them and protect them from themselves. So that's the biggest issue. You know, a lot of these guys are, and, and ladies, mm -hmm. are, are young, and they, don't, they haven't had that financial background, that education. So how you make up for that is putting things in place where they're not allowed to take all their money at once. And in, in, and in regards to the NCAA, you're talking about such a fraction uh, a small percentage of players that it's really not that big of a deal. Most players just aren't going to opt into getting paid over getting their education. And so, I mean, that's the real debate. All right, Jack, thank you very much. Uh, who do you like in the game tonight, by the way? Ohio State all the way. You know, I'm a Big Ten guy. I think the world has been uh, exposed, and now they understand that there really is athletes in the Big Ten. So Minnesota I'm rooting for the guy Bulldogs. rooting for the other team there. there. Thanks very much, Jack. We appreciate it. Jack Brewer with thank the Brewer you. Group. And coming up, new cars, new concepts, and an auto industry that is optimistic about the future, a report from the biggie, the Detroit Auto Show. The sharp and steady drop in oil prices is expected to hit the Texas state budget hard this year. Just today, the state's comptroller predicted a more than 14 percent decline in revenue from energy production and taxes coming in its upcoming two-year budget cycle, with revenue from natural gas expected to fall by 8 percent. While oil prices continue to slide, so does the cost of filling up your gas tank. U.S. drivers paid an average of $2.20 a gallon for regular gas last week. That's the lowest price for this time of year since 2009, according to the industry researcher the Lundberg Survey. AAA has the national average even cheaper right now, $2.13 a gallon, down $0.07 cents, Sue, in just the past week. Mm. Well, cheaper gas is just one reason behind strong sales of new cars and trucks over the past year. And with 50 new vehicles making their debut at this week's Detroit Auto Show, it's a pretty good bet that car sales will be strong again in the year ahead. Phil LeBeau has more from Detroit. Introducing the Chevrolet Bolt. With sales surging, the buzz is back at the Detroit Auto Show. These are good times here in Detroit and U.S. altogether. There are new performance cars and luxury models, but two electric vehicles may generate the most chatter. GM's new extended range Chevy Volt and the all-electric Chevy Bolt, 
a concept car. GM estimates the Bolt will have a range topping 200 miles when it debuts in 2017 and could sell for as little as $30,000. Can you make 30000 stick? Uh, you know, it's a concept vehicle, but if it's going to uh, fit the equation that customers are looking for, yes, that's what we're going to do. While automakers are touting greater mileage, plunging gas prices have many in the industry saying it's time to revisit fuel economy standards set five years ago, which call for auto fleets to average 54 and a half miles per gallon by 2025. In light of today's fuel prices and forecasting what they're going to be in the future, I think we just need to take a very Do they not make sense? We have to make a fact-driven analysis of what that's going to be. It's time to explore the future of Buick. For now, the focus is on a resurgence in autos not seen since the late 90s. There's, you know, there's so much enthusiasm and optimism right now. I'm hoping it's not silly optimism, right? Cockeyed optimism. It, it seems more pragmatic. Um, the lessons of 2009, 2010 aren't that far behind us, so I think there are those memories. The combination of a healthy economy and strong consumer confidence has many in the auto industry believing U.S. sales this year could top 17 million for the first time since 2001. Phil Lebeau, Nightly Business Report, Detroit. And finally tonight, some big news coming out of the Detroit Auto Show today. The 2015 Volkswagen Golf was named the North American Car of the Year by U.S. and Canadian auto writers and editors. And the new aluminum-bodied Ford F-150 pickup was named Truck of the Year. That is the eighth time Ford has taken home the Truck of the Year honors and the fourth time, by the way, for the F-150. Congratulations all around. Yes, indeed. Terrific. All right, that'll do it for Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for watching. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening. We we'll hope to see you back here tomorrow night.